Hello and welcome to this edition of World at War. My name is Mohammed Saleh. In a span of less than 30 minutes, the United States struck 85 different targets spread across seven cities in Iraq and Syria. These American airstrikes were carried out as a reprisal against a drone attack on an American base in Jordan in which three American soldiers were killed and 40 others were injured. And according to the Americans, this is just the beginning of a multi-tiered response. Even though both the Americans and the Iranians have repeatedly insisted that neither side wants a full-blown conflict. But what is abundantly clear is that the Israel-Gaza war that began on the 7th of October has spread way beyond the frontiers of Gaza. By backing the Israeli offensive in the Gaza Strip to the hilt, the United States is getting more and more involved in this new West Asia conflict. And even if the political leaders at this moment are not willing to say it out loud, what is playing out is a subtle but a steady proxy war between the United States and Iran. Our next board gets more details. This is the moment when the American fighter jets took off to strike targets deep inside Iraq and Syria. And according to the US Central Command, 125 precision munitions were dropped on 85 different targets, including the command and control operation centers, intelligence centers, weapon storage depots, and supply chain facilities of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and other affiliated armed groups backed by Tehran. The IRGC is the elite military unit of the Iranian armed forces. In a tweet put out by the American President Joe Biden, the Commander-in-Chief of the American Armed Forces insisted that the United States does not seek a conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world, but the United States would respond to anyone who did it harm. The Americans claimed that all targets that were hit were military infrastructure that had been used to strike at various American bases in the region. But the Iraqi government has condemned the attacks as a violation of Iraqi sovereignty, stating that at least about 16 people were killed and over 25 others injured, including many civilians. The American airstrikes have come in response to the deadly unmanned drone attack that took place on an American military base in Jordan called Tower 22. Three American soldiers were killed, including 23-year-old Breonna Alexandria Moffett, 24-year-old Kennedy Landon Sanders, and 46-year-old Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, while 40 other American soldiers sustained injuries. Since the Israel-Gaza war began on the 7th of October, there have been at least about 150 attacks on different American bases in the Middle East. But the attack in Jordan is being seen as an inflection point in this conflict. Uh, so it seems that this um, attack was carried out by a group calling itself the Islamic Resistance in Iraq. That's not a real group. That's a name that's been used by various um, militias, uh, Iranian-backed militias that are, tend to be Iraqi, but also operate in Syria. And they've been using that name during the Gaza conflict as they have stepped up drone attacks um, and missile attacks on US interests. Um, previously, the US has responded by targeting senior leaders, um, by killing members of the groups um, who have uh, been about to launch attacks. Um, so this will have to be an escalation from that. And that's quite serious, not least because these groups are officially part of the Iraqi security services. And so this can't be done without the Iraqi state being involved. Iran's axis of resistance includes different groups that are spread across the Middle East. And ever since the Israel-Gaza war has broken out, they've repeatedly struck American targets in the region. In Yemen, the Houthis are backed by Iran. In Lebanon, the Hezbollah has the backing of Tehran. In Iraq, there are several Shiite militant factions, such as the Qatab Hezbollah, the hardline Sunni group, the Hashid Shabi, the Asaib Ahle Al-Haq, and the Al-Badr organization that are backed by Iran. The American president bore witness to the remains of the three American soldiers as they were brought back home. The American backing of the Israeli offensive has meant that American targets are being viewed as fair game by militant factions who claim that they are carrying out these attacks in solidarity with the Palestinians who are facing a humanitarian catastrophe. 
while many others have even questioned what American troops are doing in Iraq and Syria anyway. The Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi, echoing the American President Joe Biden's statement, insisted that Iran too is not looking for a war, but in the same breath reiterated that Iran would not be bullied. We have said many times we will not initiate any war, but if anyone wants to bully, Iran will respond firmly. The military power of Iran in the region is not and never will be a threat to any country. Rather, it ensures the security of the countries in the region. At the moment, the American priority seems to be to back the Israeli offensive in Gaza, while at the same time to manage the upheavals that have been created by the Israeli offensive in the Gaza Strip. But what this has sparked is a proxy war between the United States and other Iranian-backed factions in the whole of the Middle East. The United States and several other nations have suspended aid to UNRWA, the main humanitarian agency in the Gaza Strip, since the 26th of January. The unprecedented funding crisis was precipitated by the Israeli allegations that 13 out of UNRWA's 13,000 staff members in the Gaza Strip were involved in the 7th of October attack in Israel, in which about 1,200 people died. Now, Tel Aviv claims that as many as about 190 UNRWA staff were militants. UNRWA, 150 of whose staff members have been killed since October last year, shelters almost about a million Palestinians in its buildings besides running several other essential services. If funding is not restored soon, then the United Nations Agency would have to end its operations by the end of this month. As a course corrective measure, it had promptly fired the staff after being alerted of Israeli allegations. Now, the UNRWA chief, Felipe Lazzarini, has dubbed the suspension of aid as an additional collective punishment on the Palestinian people. Our next poll gets more details. Founded in 1949, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA, is the main humanitarian provider in Gaza, which is under the incessant barrage of Israeli bombardment since the 7th of October last year. In Gaza, the UNRWA employs 13,000 people who run schools, healthcare clinics and a host of other essential services. It is almost like a quasi-state which provides direct services as well as loans to Palestinians. Overall, it supports some 6 million Palestinian refugees living inside and outside Palestine. In 2021, about 545,000 children were enrolled in UNRWA schools. Its social safety net program assistance benefited 398,044 beneficiaries and 1.7 million received critical humanitarian aid. UNRWA's significance for Palestinians can be gauged by the fact that since Israel launched its war on Hamas on the 7th of October, approximately a million Palestinians from the Gaza Strip or nearly 45% of the enclave's population have found refuge at UNRWA schools, clinics and other public buildings. Nearly the entire population in Gaza is now reliant on UNRWA for basic necessities including food, water and basic hygiene supplies. In addition to this, thousands of Palestinians are employed by the specialized UN agency, providing them much-needed employment for the last seven decades. The Israeli allegations, in the opinion of some experts, remain unverified. Israeli Prime Minister, though, claimed after suspension of funding that the UN agency has been completely taken over by the militant group Hamas. There are other agencies in the UN, there are other agencies in the world, they have to replace UNRWA. UNRWA is totally infiltrated with Hamas, 
It has been in the service of Hamas, in its schools, and in many other things. I say this with great regret, because we hoped that there would be uh, an objective and constructive body to offer aid. In 2022, the UNRWA received some $1.17 billion in total pledges, with its largest government donors being the US, Germany and the European Union. Following Israeli allegations, at least nine countries have announced that they are suspending or reviewing their donations to the UN agency. The US, Germany and Switzerland have suspended funding, whereas the European Union announced its decision to review its funding. Highlighting the actions taken, the United Nations appealed for the continuation of the critical humanitarian work. Uh, the, the critical humanitarian work that the UN does, not only in, 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 uh, in, in Gaza, all over the region, needs to be supported. People's lives depend on it. We are doing in parallel, taking very seriously all the allegations that have been made. We are, uh, we are being forward-leaning. It was UNRWA that announced this, right? They took the first step. Uh, they had briefed critical donors. Uh, they had briefed certain parties before that happened. They were given information. They took the steps. Um, so. We have a process of accountability that's, that's going on. While that's going on, people need to survive, and we need continued support for UNRWA and all our humanitarian work. Deji. Children who make up almost half of Gaza's population of 2.3 million are likely to be the most affected by this suspension in funding. Their lives have already been shattered by the brutal war. More than 11,500 under the age of 18 have been killed. More have been wounded, many of them with life-changing injuries. Given the situation, it is difficult to get accurate figures, but more than 24,000 children are believed to have lost one or both of their parents. UNICEF, United Nations Children's Agency, has expressed its biggest concern for an estimated 19,000 children who are orphaned or who have ended up alone with no adult to look after them. Additionally, UNICEF believes that all children in Gaza are now in need of mental health support. In such a bleak scenario, suspension of the critical UNRWA funding could prove to be the death knell for the Gazan children. As Pakistan prepares for its general elections on the 8th of February, it was served a cruel reminder late on the 29th of January that all is not well in its largest province, Balochistan. The rest of the province was jolted when heavily armed terrorists launched three coordinated attacks, including one on a high security prison. Now, the attacks left four law enforcement personnel and two civilians dead. A 12-hour gun battle was triggered in which nine of the terrorists were killed. The banned separatist group, Baloch Liberation Army, claimed responsibility for the attacks. But the question is this, how potent is the danger posed by the Baloch Liberation Army? And why has Pakistan failed so far in reining in the separatists? Our next poll gets you more details. Balochistan is Pakistan's largest province by territory, but the smallest in terms of population. Despite being blessed with mineral resources and vast reserves of natural gas, the province has remained the country's poorest, giving rise to a broader rebellion. The decades-old rebel movement blames the Pakistani government of neglecting its residents and unfair distribution of resources. Most prominent of these rebel groups in the southwestern Balochistan province is the Baloch Liberation Army. On the night between January 29th and the 30th, multiple terrorists, including suicide bombers, belonging to the Baloch Liberation Army, targeted military and security installations with guns and rockets in the city of Mach, which is 65 kilometers south of Balochistan's capital, Quetta. 
At least nine terrorists, including three suicide bombers, were killed and three wounded when they tried to penetrate the high-security central much jail. Reportedly, some security officials though claimed the death toll to be as high as 21. Some 800 inmates, including 90 on death row, are incarcerated at the much jail. The attacks have once again put the spotlight on the restive province, which is a key location in China's $60 billion China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPEC. CPEC is part of Chinese President Xi Jinping's massive Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative. Pakistan security officials, as well as Chinese citizens working in the province, have been targeted, triggering a forceful response from the Pakistani state. The attacks have also come amid heightened global attention on Balochistan following an Iranian airstrike last month. At least two children were killed on the outskirts of Panjgur city in Balochistan in the airstrike, which Tehran said targeted another armed group, Jesh al adil based in the province. A couple of days later, Islamabad launched a retaliatory attack, killing at least nine people. Islamabad claimed to possess credible intelligence that some armed groups had been given sanctuary in Iran. Monday night's attack against the security forces is the deadliest this year and an apparent retaliation for Pakistani strikes inside Iran on the 18th of January. How long will this vicious cycle of tit-for-tat attacks continue is anyone's guess. But it sure doesn't bode well for the nation's security, especially in its largely lawless border areas with Iran. The Myanmar junta is facing the toughest challenge to its authority since seizing power in a February 2021 coup. A coalition of three armed ethnic minority groups called the Brotherhood Alliance have made some significant gains in the north thereby galvanizing other opponents of the junta. Increasingly losing ground, the military has now stepped up its own air assaults, with civilians frequently being at the receiving end. Since the 2021 coup, more than 4,400 people have been killed in the military's crackdown on dissent. The United Nations estimates that about 2.3 million people have been displaced so far in this violence. On the eve of the coup's third anniversary, Myanmar's military rulers extended a state of emergency that was in place since 2021 by another six months, once again delaying the promised elections. While announcing the extension of the state of emergency, Myanmar's army chief, Min Ong Liang, has pledged to crush all opposition to the military rule. Our next report gets you more details. The Southeast Asian nation of Myanmar was plunged into crisis when in the early hours of February 1st, 2021, Myanmar military rounded up Nobel laureate Aung San Suu Kyi. And lawmakers from a democratically elected National League for Democracy, or NLD party, as they prepared to take their seats in parliament. The military accused Suu Kyi's party of widespread fraud during polls held weeks before, in which the military-backed candidate was trounced by the NLD. Mass protests against this illegal power grab erupted across the country. Military generals responded to these nationwide protests with brute force. According to the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners, a local monitoring group, more than 25,730 people have been arrested for opposing the coup, with almost 20,000 of them still in detention. The junta's bullets, batons and network of undercover agents and informants stamped out open dissent on the streets of major urban centres. But across swathes of the countryside and borderlands, it was a different story. Home to more than a dozen ethnic groups, in these borderlands, the rebels had waged a war against the military over autonomy and control of lucrative resources for decades. The 2021 coup united pro-democracy activists in towns and cities with the ethnic minority forces fighting in the hinterlands. On the 27th of October, a coalition of three ethnic rebel groups known as the Brotherhood Alliance, the Thang National Liberation Army, the Arakan Army and the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, or MNDAA, launched coordinated attacks on the military across a swathe of Myanmar's northern Shan state. The Brotherhood Alliance is believed to have a strength of 15,000 fighters. 
Reportedly, they've overrun more than 100 military posts, captured border crossings and the vital roads carrying most of the overland trade with China. A Beijing-brokered peace deal has paused the fighting in the north. But the Brotherhood Alliance has largely kept its recent gains and clashes have continued elsewhere. On the eve of the third anniversary of the military power grab, National Defence and Security Council, presided by junta chief Minong Elang, extended emergency rule for a further six months. The extension is deemed necessary by the junta chief to undertake tasks essential to bring the nation to a normal state of stability and peace. After the announcement, the United Nations expressed concern about the political developments in Myanmar. The crisis in Myanmar continues to deteriorate with devastating impacts on civilians. On this somber anniversary, the Secretary General underscores the urgency of forging a path forward, a democratic transition with a return to civilian rule. The Secretary General condemns all forms of violence and calls for the protection of civilians and the cessation of hostilities. An inclusive solution for this crisis requires conditions that permit the people of Myanmar to exercise their human rights freely and peacefully. The military's campaign of violence targeting civilians, political repression must end, and those responsible for that repression must be held to account. Protests took place in Thailand and the Philippines on the third anniversary of the 2021 coup, demanding an end to the military regime in Myanmar. Hundreds of protesters, young and old, gathered outside the United Nations headquarters in Bangkok. They were wearing T-shirts emblazoned with the image of Suchi, had white flowers in their hair and red bandanas on their foreheads. Screaming and crying, they chanted passionately, calling for a restoration of democracy in Myanmar. Since the coup, the United States, the European Union, the United Kingdom and others have imposed sanctions on the military regime. The United Nations and human rights groups have accused the military of rights abuses. In their crackdown on dissent, including crimes against humanity, the country's anti-coup forces claim that with each passing day, they are moving closer to victory. The offensive has put pressure on Minong Ileng, who in a first is also facing criticism from the nationalists and regime supporters. All this has weakened the military's hold on power and put them at their most vulnerable in the last 60 years. How long will the Myanmar military hold on to power? Will the armed opposition across the country end up usurping power? When will elections promised by the generals after the coup finally be held? A nation in turmoil since the 2021 coup awaits answers anxiously. And with that, that's a wrap on this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the RD that you see on your screens. I'm your host, Mohamed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week.